Applied linguistics as an academic field is expanding rapidly. A wide range and variety of areas of interest in applied linguistics have been extensively and intensively researched. And research provides a common language for applied linguists from different subfields with different research approaches to communicate, to share ideas and experiences, and to create valuable academic and social networks. The goal of this conference is therefore to share and learn about a variety of aspects of doing research in applied linguistics, including purposes and uses of research in applied linguistics, research paradigms and their applications, autonomy inside and outside the classroom, teacher and researcher autonomy, autonomy and learning environment. This includes classroom, distance, technology supported, language learning centers, and so on autonomy and assessment, and many more. To serve these purposes, we have arranged a variety of sessions in many forms, ranging from the plenary sessions by honorable invited speakers, parallel sessions by researchers, novice researchers, and PhD students, as well as poster sessions. Through the common language of research, I hope this three-day conference would contribute to our better understanding of applied linguistics fields, keep ourselves updated with new knowledge, and enjoy the chances to create a strong collaboration network among ourselves. On this opportunity, I would like to call upon the president of KMUTT to officially declare open the Dra Naila conference. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Parnapit, especially for testing this uh, equipment for me. <laughs> well, the ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I'd uh, like to welcome all of you here at uh, Kim Wong University of Technology, Tobri. And thank you for being very cordial and uh, non informal. I, I love uh, informality, I can take my coats off, I wish I can take my ties off in time, but uh, anyway, welcome all of you here, and uh, especially the, the distinguished uh, plenary speakers, uh, Professor Guy Cook from King's College, uh, Professor Tan B. Tin from uh, Auckland, uh, Professor Phil Benson from Macquarie University, and of course, all the distinguished uh, speakers and uh, participants. This is an international conference on doing research in applied linguistic. Two, it said, so this is the second one, and independent learning. It is certainly uh, very nice to have so many uh, foreign, uh, non Thai, I should say. I, I hate the word foreigners. Non Thai, the uh, non Thai uh, participants here. Because uh, of all the things that our university are very good at, the science, technology, innovation, and we have great interest in education. And we are very good at, uh, I think, linguistics, according to our friends here in these uh, schools and other schools around us. We, we are not very good at being known to be internationalized, even though many of the conferences that you go to, we see this sort of uh, uh, participants. So if anything, uh, do try to get uh, your friends to, uh, to know KMUTT better. We fail badly when the people ask around the world, do you know KMUTT? The answer is usually no. You know, there are other universities in Thailand much more famous. Anyway, that's uh, part of the the message I would like to ask and request you to, to help us. Um, we are organizing this with uh, Macquarie University. Uh, welcome uh, Professor Phil Benson back. He said he was here 16 years ago, 16, 17 years ago. I, I, w I was around, but uh, probably elsewhere in Bangkok, Thailand. And, uh, and the first time that we have the Independent Learning Association a very interesting name uh, because we 
here we name the word uh, collaborations, uh, we name the word team teachings, we, name, we, uh, we stress the word uh, collective impact. But yes, independent learning is very important, isn't it? Uh, to, to have our, our students do well, they, they ought to be able to do independent learning well. Of course, as teachers, we like to do better as a team, team teaching, and, and of course, we like them to do team learning as well. Anyway, it's very interesting, and I, 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 I look forward to, to more collaborations uh, in, in the areas of uh, independent learning. The topics of the conference, uh, doing research in applied linguistic and independent learning is certainly with uh, particular interest to KMUTTT, even though I mentioned we are STI University, but as I said, we are very much interested in education. And above all, we like to see our students be much more uh, internationalized, be much better at communicating in non-Thai language, and even in Thai. So I, I suppose linguistics cover both Thai, non-Thai, and other things. And it has been my constant request to Ajahn Parnapit about the involvement in getting the School of Liberal Arts uh, to help us uh, improve the uh, communication skills of our students, particularly in English. I think we have done pretty well, but to our, our concerns, not quite well enough when it comes to other people look at our graduates. They say we are very good at everything except perhaps communication in English. So. We've been uh, trying very hard, and uh, we see many things that we can do. And I suppose the research in linguistic certainly can help us uh, uh, to improve in this. Of course, you would need a lot of participation from other faculties, from other schools, uh, other departments, and uh, of course, the collaborations of the students themselves, who somehow, I think, the independent learning uh, needs will, will certainly help us. How do we motivate the students to, 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 be, uh, to be real 21st century learners? A another, another theme that uh, people like Ajahn Bandit sitting here trying to push across our students here at uh, KMUTT. So these are the reason I think uh, we feel that this sort of conference uh, perhaps he, uh, the schools can do this more than every four years, perhaps uh, doing this more often uh, will certainly help us. Of course, doing research is one thing, applying the research to the real life is another thing, but uh, we certainly like to see that. Moreover, being a, a research university, uh, we are one of the nine uh, research universities in Thailand. Uh, we love uh, to, to create uh, environment for research. Conference is part of a very important uh, environment to doing re uh, for, for researchers, and we'd like to see more, more conferences, more research, more real uh, discussion on research topics and research works here at our university. Another of our needs to improve is the research environment. Uh, Another, we have two bandits here. Uh, Professor Bandit, uh, Fung Thamasan, who is here, he's the Vice President on Research and uh, Innovations, uh, would love to, to see more and more of these sort of things because uh, we like to, 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 do, uh, to, to create better environment for research. So it it's doesn't matter with the, uh, uh, it's, uh, in which areas, but uh, at the moment, uh, numbers uh, and activities are, are a lot more important. But uh, having said that, I, I feel that uh, communication skills is going to be so very important to our future generations. And uh, I can see that uh, applied linguistics will certainly play a great uh, 
deal of uh, importance in training our younger generations to come. So I would like to uh, uh, put that upon your shoulders, many shoulders here, uh, to help us in the improving the quality of our future graduates. Again, KMUDT graduates has been very good at their, their, their professional skills. Uh, they have been very good and well received by the industry. And again, their weakness, as I mentioned, uh, needs to be improved. And I think it's our responsibilities here at the university to try to improve th their skills in terms of uh, those uh, communications and critical thinking. This school is, has been very important lately. Not that it wasn't important before, but it's been uh, asked to help us uh, at our university more and more because we, we, are, we, we feel that KMUTT has been well known for several pioneering uh, educational schemes, one of which is here, I think, what do you call it? The uh, self access Learning Center. And we have other uh, educational innovations at KMUTT. And we like to say to people, and they think we are uh, good at working together across department, across faculties, creating what we call collective impact. Over the, the, since last year and over the next few years, we like to train our engineers and technologists using liberal arts philosophy in training. And in fact, we have set up a new schools, a new schools, physical schools, 150 kilometers from here next to Myanmar borders uh, to train future engineers based on liberal arts uh, philosophy, still training the engineer and technologists. So again, just to let you know that these sort of things are something that uh, we like to apply here at, uh, at our university. And we have other uh, concepts in education that we are pushing. Uh, we have construction, construction system schools, we have story-based learning high schools, and we work with children a lot. So I think you will enjoy it, uh, coming to visit us and uh, working with us. So with all that, thank you very much for uh, getting me here, looking at your shadow, uh, sh shadow very interesting. And I hope to listen to uh, Professor guide uh, here for a little bit because his topic was so interesting uh, to me anyway, science, technology, and linguistics. But uh, I'm afraid I have to run out in the middle of your talk, so I'm sorry about that. Anyway, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I would look forward to seeing many of your faces again in the future. Thank you very much, and uh, op I declare this meeting open. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sakarin and Dr. Panapit for the welcoming remarks. Before we proceed to the first... Okay. Before we proceed to the first talk of the day... Let's have a moment to remember our friend David Hall from Macquarie University who recently passed away. David initiated the teaching and research cooperation between SOLA and Macquarie University. He was also a big part to make this conference possible. Now it's high time we invited our first plenary speaker, Professor Guy Cook from King's College London with his long, endless track record of academic work in applied linguistics, English language teaching, and discourse analysis. We will just 
get rid of ourselves and let you enjoy the very first talk of Drow 2 and Isla. Hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. Okay, good morning. Uh, can you hear me all right? Is the microphone working? Yeah? Good. And right at the back you can hear me. Good, great, fantastic, good. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, such a wonderful country and a wonderful city to visit and delighted to be at this conference. Um, my topic is science, technology and values in applied linguistics and I hope this is appropriate uh, for a university of technology. Why not, okay? Uh, and I'm now a bit scared about uh, having a very illustrious uh, scientist listening to what I'm saying. But uh, you'll be walking out halfway through, so, <laughs> so that's fine. I won't misunderstand. Uh, I want to take as my starting point um, a sentence which, when I read it, struck me as very odd. Applied linguistics is a technology. This is from a 1992 Encyclopedia of Linguistics and the entry on applied linguistics by two very eminent applied linguists, Henry Widdison and Bob Kaplan. They say applied linguistics is a technology which makes abstract ideas and research findings accessible and relevant to the real world. It mediates between theory and practice. So I want to, in, in this talk, to reflect on what seemed to me when I first read it an odd statement. Applied linguistics is a technology and I want to uh, divide this talk into three parts. So first of all, I'm going to say some things about technology in general. Secondly, about the development and scope of applied linguistics uh, in recent years and as it is now. And then thirdly, I'm going to um, take a particular example of what seems to be a technological innovation in applied linguistics which is related to language teaching. And I hope this will be appropriate for this conference, which, which uh, has, as I understand it, two types of audience uh, with a lot in common, those of you interested in independent learning and those of you inter interested in applied linguistics. So this is the structure of my talk. And it may be a rather long flight, okay? So I suggest that you uh, fasten your seatbelts or unfasten your seatbelts and uh, uh, recline your seats and maybe get a little bit of sleep uh, as we go, and I'll, I'll tell you when we're coming into land. <laughs> okay, so what is technology? Let's think about that first without relevance to language teaching in particular. Well, if you look in uh, dictionaries, you get something like this. Uh, technology is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, right? Nice and straightforward, and then sometimes they will add especially for industry. And you think, well, does that apply to the kind of things we do in applied linguistics? Is it an industry? Well, uh, many people now do talk about applied linguistics and certainly about English language teaching as an industry. You may know the phrase, the EFL industry, which is used by, for example, John Gray and others. And we also know in universities around the world 
that governments now increasingly see the rationale for financing universities in economic terms. So these are the three um, mission statements for supporting research by the ESRC, which is one of the big government research funding councils in Britain. So the first thing that comes up is economic performance and sustainable growth. I'm not sure if those two are compatible, but anyway, the point that I'm making is that research now increasingly throughout the world is always assessed in terms of its ability to contribute to economic performance. So it, we seem to be increasingly seen as a technology. But let's just think about technology in general before I go on to talking about applied linguistics as a technology. And I'd just like to look at three uh, instances of technology, two of which seem very straightforward and one of seems which seems a little bit more complicated, although even the straightforward ones are not perhaps as straightforward as they seem. So a prime instance of technology is medicine. This seems to be extremely straightforward. We know stuff because of medical science. We know stuff, or not we, but people know. The people who all we want to know know stuff about the human body, and they can then apply that in preventing diseases, curing diseases, performing life-saving operations like this one, it seems to be an extremely straightforward case of the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. You would have to be a very peculiar person to think that if you know how to cure somebody, you shouldn't do so. It seems morally very straightforward. On the other hand, of course, it's even medicine can be a little bit more complicated. You could use, use knowledge about the human body to perfect torture. And there are cases of medical intervention where there is controversy. Should this person be resuscitated? Is euthanasia right? Is abortion right? And so on and so forth. So even in the case of uh, medical technology, there, are, there is more to it than the science, let's put it that way. Another straightforward case, the case of nuclear weapons. This seems to be the opposite case, almost. Here you have scientific knowledge, which enables extraordinary destruction. It isn't, of course, the case that the knowledge necessarily leads to the application, and many of the most eloquent and profound opponents of the use of nuclear science for nuclear weapons have been the very people who understand it best and have developed it best. So there seems to be, as, as it were, another simple case, although of course there are arguments, not arguments I personally agree with, but there are people who argue that nuclear weapons can preserve the peace and so on and so forth. Um, there was, if you remember, even an American uh, nuclear bomb delivering missile with the very strange name of the peacekeeper. Or a third technology, which is uh, maybe a little less simple than the other two, on which I did some research in the discourse analysis of arguments for and against what you can see in this picture, genetically modified crops. Here you have scientific knowledge which can be used for a particular practical purpose, and you have around it Tremendous controversy. Tremendous controversy not only about the science itself. Is it dangerous? Is there a danger of migration of genes? Is, there, is it going to be good or bad for wildlife or whatever? You have arguments on both sides. It doesn't, I don't want to go into the details of that now. And then you have also arguments which are not to do with the science or the physical consequences of genetic modification they are uh, social and political. Is this spreading the power of a very few uh, international corporations? Is it being promoted by certain governments over others? Is it a way of controlling smaller farmers? Is it going to have effects on employment patterns? Is it what people want? And so on and so forth. So this is, in a way, a different kind of technology. So I've given you three examples, three very straightforward examples, three very uh, paradigmatic examples, I think. One, a technology which seems to be uncontroversially, in a general sense, good, medicine. 
one which seems to be uncontroversially bad, nuclear weapons, and one which is an instance which is probably the case with most technologies of something on, of, of about which you could make an argument on both sides. Okay, so that's by way of a preamble. And uh, I haven't said anything yet about applied linguistics or language teaching. What I want to do now is to think about applied linguistics as a technology. How, what kind of technology is it? Is it like a life-saving operation or a nuclear bomb or a genetically modified crop? I want to be quite historical in this talk, uh, as you'll see, but I want to be historical in a way that I hope will illuminate the present. But let's just go back in applied linguistics and think about how it was in its origin, how it was conceived, whether it was conceived as a technology. One of the founders of applied linguistics was a man called Pitt Corder, who you, I'm sure you have heard of, uh, who writing in the 1970s, wrote that applied linguistics is the application of applied, of, sorry, the application of linguistic knowledge to some object, or applied linguistics, as its name implies, is an activity. It is not a theoretical study. It makes use of the findings of theoretical studies. The applied linguist is a consumer or user, not a producer of theories. So for Corder, there was a science, which is linguistics, and applied linguistics was, as it were, a channel from the science to practice. And what practice was he talking about? Language teaching. So he wrote, of all the areas of applied linguistics, none has shown the effects of linguistic findings, principles, and techniques more than foreign language teaching so much so that the term applied linguistics is often taken as being synonymous with that task. So at this inception of applied linguistics, it seemed to be quite straightforward in two ways. First of all, it is a straightforward direction, right? There is science, linguists, linguistics is the science. There is a, a kind of deliverer of that science, the applied linguist, and then there is the consumer, the language teacher. So it's a straightforward direction, and it has one particular application. Very nice. Wouldn't it have been nice and simple to be an applied linguist in the 1970s? Seems so straightforward. I'm not criticizing Pitt Corder. Uh, I, this, you know, this is early days. Things became more complicated. You may know uh, an important distinction made by one of Pitt Corder's uh, students, Henry Widdison, when in 1984, he made a distinction between what he called linguistics applied and applied linguistics. And what he meant by this was that linguistics applied is this conception of Corder's. It's a one-way flow of science through the technologist to the consumer. Uh, it's unproblematic, it's rather paternal, patriarchal if you like, it's authoritative, there's no problem, okay? It's like medical science. The doctor knows, the, uh, the medical science scientist knows the fact that the doctor knows what to do and we all benefit from it. Seems very straightforward. Doesn't take account of people's own wishes. Maybe this person, uh, you know, if you take a case like euthanasia, for example, that is not a scientific decision, that is a moral, personal, legal decision, other factors come in. So Widdison made the distinction between linguistics applied, a straightforward application, and what he called applied linguistics, redefining re the term in a way in which the flow would be in two directions. There would be information from scientific research, from linguistics, but there would also be a feedback from the consumer. So there's one very big change in applied linguistics. It became a more dynamic, a more mediated activity, less of a one-way direction. The other big change going on into the 1990s is in the scope of applied linguistics. Now all of this will affect how we perceive it as a technology. So a very uh, often quoted definition of applied linguistics by colleague of Henry Widdison's, uh, Christopher Brumfrid, 
is that applied linguistics is the theoretical and empirical investigation of real world problems in which language is a central issue. Now here you have a different kind of change. Widdowson is changing the nature of the relationship between knowledge and activity. Brumfit is changing the scope. If you take this as the definition of applied linguistics, the theoretical and empirical investigation of real world problems in which language is a central issue, then you have to ask the question, well, what kind of problems are there in which language isn't a central issue? It seems to involve absolutely everything. And as Greg Myers uh, commented in a special issue of Applied Linguistics about this definition by Chris Brumfit, it is hard to think of any real world problems from global warming to refugees to genetic counseling to, to outsourced call centers to AIDS, HIV to military intelligence that does not have a crucial component of language use. So applied linguistics changing in two very key ways in the relationship between knowledge and practice and in its scope. And of course, once it changes in scope, then it's much harder to have a kind of set rule as to what the relationship between what is done and what is known. It becomes a much more complicated technology in all kinds of ways. Now just in, think, in case you think I'm locked into the past completely, okay, uh, let's come right back up to date. Uh, my, my intention in this talk, and I'm going to be going even further back into the past a bit later, is to understand the present in terms of, of where it comes from, if you like. If you look at the journal Applied Linguistics, as it is now in 214, and generally accepted to be the leading journal of our field, certainly the highest ranked if you if you believe in rankings, okay. And you read those pages in the journal which people don't often read unless they're about to submit an article, which is say, what is the aim, what are the aims of this journal? Well, the aims of this journal actually reflect both of those changes, both a, a particular conception of the relationship between knowledge and practice and a particularly broad view of the scope of applied linguistics. So the journal sees itself as concerned with the study of language-related problems in specific situations in which people use and learn languages. Within this framework, the journal welcomes contributions from, and then you have a very long list, which was reorganized in the last five years uh, to make it alphabetical. This is quite an important thing. I will read through the areas. Bilingualism and multilingualism computer-mediated communication, conversation analysis, corpus linguistics, critical discourse analysis, deaf linguistics, discourse analysis and pragmatics, first and additional language learning, teaching and use, forensic linguistics, language assessment and testing, language planning and policy, language for specific purposes, lexicography, literacies, multimodal communication, rhetoric and stylistics, translation and interpreting. A very long list and an open-ended list, as Greg Myers has pointed out. So to establish principles for the relationship between knowledge and practice, in other words, principles for applied linguistics as a technology, is increasingly difficult because you, you have an open-ended list of possible applications. So one of the things I wanted to try and uh, do in this talk is think about, uh, you know, some general principles, general principles for assessing us, what we do as a technology. Okay, I said it was a long flight, right? So here we are, we're about 30,000 feet high, uh, cruising at about 1,000 miles an hour or however fast airplanes go, 600 miles an hour. And what I hope to have established um, is, by the way, is the microphone still okay? I'm shouting away here as though I didn't have a microphone, but uh, is it okay if I talk, you still hear me? Yeah, okay, good, right, okay. I won't, I won't feel the need to shout. Um, I hope to have established a few things, okay? So applied linguistics is a technology. Decisions about technologies involve evaluation. That's clear with medicine, bombs, genetic modification, 
and I think with any technology. And contemporary applied linguistics, uh, contemporary applied linguistics technology is both dynamic and broad in its scope. It's not, as it was in the days of Pitt Corder, a straightforward transmission, nor is it a transmission to one activity. It's many, many activities, and in all cases, the applied linguist needs to interact with the consumer. Now, what I want to do now is to take one case, which I have been particularly interested in researching in the recent past, uh, one case where there seems to be uh, a change in practice which is technological. In other words, it's inspired by, or apparently inspired by, scientific findings, if, if linguistics uh, is a kind of science, okay? And I've chosen this topic because uh, I hope that it's suitable for what is a mixed audience, isn't it? Because this conference, as I understand it, is uh, about applied linguistics and also about independent learning. So something about learning and teaching, which is of interest to both sides, I hope, okay? You'll tell me afterwards if I was wrong. But anyway, too late for the moment, <laughs> okay? Right. What I want to look at is what I have called the monolingual assumption. Uh, the monolingual assumption, which has been very widespread in language teaching, and particularly English language teaching, is the belief that the best way to teach and learn a language is through the medium of that language itself. Uh, in other words, you do not use or allow the student to use their own language. Everything should be done in the language you are teaching. So for people who are learning English, they do not need within the classroom to use their own language and they will not encounter it in the classroom. This has, I think, some particular relevance for independent learning, but I'll come back to that later on because, of course, uh, as those of you involved in studying independent learning must be very well aware, most research on language teaching and learning assumes a teacher and assumes a classroom. I want to approach this, this monolingual assumption from four angles, and I would like to suggest that you could approach any technological activity from these four angles. So, although, although these are particularly to do with language teaching, but they have equivalents in other technologies. So these are historical, scientific, and you'll s I've put scare quotes around scientific, you'll see why later. Pedagogic, which is if you're talking about language teaching, pedagogic is to do with uh, uh, how the audience, how the receiver responds, you know, what, what works, as it were. And that has an equivalent in medicine, for example, you know, is the patient happy with what the doctor is doing? And the fourth criterion is educational, which is to do with values, which is also relevant, I think, to any technology. So looking at this monolingual assumption, the very, very widespread and long-lasting view that it's best to teach or learn a language through the medium of that language itself. This is, I think, a tale of two extremes. One extreme, very prevalent now, one extreme in the past. Let me give you an instance of these two extremes. Um, there was a survey conducted some years ago by a woman called Marcia Fisk Ong, a textbook writer who I believe lives in Thailand now. I've lost touch with her. She's not, you're not in the audience, Marcia, are you? No, okay, right. Um, <laughs> that's a shame. Anyway, she did a survey of teacher and teacher trainer attitudes to the use of students' own languages in the classroom around the world. And she came up with really interesting data from her interviews, and she came up with two different types of response. Fundamentally, either people were using their own language to teach, uh, using two lang languages to teach, using translation, for example, but feeling rather guilty about it, or they were very extreme in their rejection, okay? So she came up, for example, with, with things like this not so far away from Thailand, neighboring country, okay? Uh, a teacher trainer who says, I will say 
that I have taken a strong stand against any use of the L1 in an L2 classroom, and all my TESOL students know that if they ever utter a word of Bahasa Malaysia in the classroom, I will burst into their classroom and strangle them in front of their students. Very, very extreme, right? You must not do this, right? Absolutely wrong. So you say, well, if this is so extreme, why? Well, historically, of course, it's a reaction against another kind of extreme, the extreme of a way of teaching known as grammar translation, which you're all too young ever to have experienced, although I was taught like that when I was at school. Grammar translation works something like this, okay? This is a Russian course from the uh, 1970s. It is, interestingly, for those of you interested in independent learning, a self-teaching book, right? It's, uh, it's, it's not from Teach Yourself, but it's a penguin course, right? And one of the things you need to ask is, you know, for people who are independent learners, which is a very substantial proportion of language teachers, what's the relationship to their own language? How are they going to get into things if not through their own language? Anyway, grammar translation, very straightforward. If you can see this, I don't know if you know any Russian, okay? You will in a minute, <laughs> okay? Uh, first of all, a list of words with translation equivalents, right? Voda, water, Volga, Volga, Vot, here is, da, yes, and so on and so forth. So you learn those. You learn words as translation equivalents. Then you get a rule explained in your own language, okay? So this is a book for English speakers, and it says absence of article in, uh, absence of article in Russian. The Russian language has no article. The noun dom may mean the house, a house, or house depending on the sense, okay? Very curious, actually. Why, why start with this rule? Well, because if you're an English speaker, that's a very strange rule, okay? Next rule, omission of verb corresponding to the English is, are in the present tense. For some reason, this person misses the article out in their own English, okay? Sounds a bit like Chinese person speaking English. Omission of verb, right? Anyway. Again, this is, if you're an English speaker, that's an odd, odd rule. So you tell people the odd rule, so you learn the vocabulary, you learn the rule, and then you do translations, right? Wonderfully vivid, exciting sentences. The house is here, here is a house, here is a lamp, and so on and so forth, okay? You translate those backwards and forwards, the teacher marks right or wrong, uh, and then you move on to the next chapter. You never encounter a word or a rule that you haven't learned, right? So it's nice and accumulative, okay? Well, it's quite extreme. And obviously, grammar translation has lots of disadvantages. It's very dry. It's very dull. Well, I'm, I don't know, quite dull. <laughs> uh, it's all writing and no speaking, right? Quite important. It's all accuracy and no fluency, doesn't matter how long you take to translate the house is here, just matters that you get it right. You can spend all night if you want. It's all form and no communication, and it's very easily mocked. So you, you giggled a bit too early, actually, for me, when I said the house is here, you laugh. Well, speakers for centuries, well, not for centuries, for decades, have, uh, you know, it's easy to produce sentences to do with grammar translation that are very funny, okay? The cat of my aunt is more treacherous than the dog of your uncle. My sons have bought the mirrors of the Duke. Horses are taller than tigers. And this is one that, that Henry Sweet, who was one of the opponents of grammar translation, I'll come to him in a minute, uh, his teacher actually used, the philosopher pulled the lower jaw of the hen. I wrote an article about this sentence once. I don't, I don't myself, you know, it, okay, funny, silly, but maybe helpful, you know. And if, if you remember, uh, you know, the philosopher pulled the lower jaw of the hen in Greek, well, it might be useful one day. Not, not, not because you are talking about a philosopher pulling the lower jaw of a hen, but you might need the word for jaw or something like that, okay. Right, anyway, lots of disadvantages nevertheless. So two extremes, right? One extreme you've got the teacher trainer who will strangle her teacher trainees if they ever utter a word of their own language. And the other extreme, you've got 
uh, language just seen as translation, a kind of formal equivalence in writing between one thing and the other. Many people recently have thought about finding something between the two, okay, some kind of alternative to extremism, so some judicious or optimal own language use. Ernesto Macaro, who does a lot of research on bilingual teaching, is, something like, is seeking something like this. An appropriate combination, uh, as Stern said tw 20 years ago. Uh, a structured and principled deployment of own language. Uh, Butzkam and Corzell. I will come back to these references later on. It, did you get a handout, by the way? Yeah, good, okay. So I've put some references on those handouts, okay. So seeking some kind of, uh, some kind of um, appropriate compromise permission uh, uh, situation between the two, and not just using the student's own language um, over much, or uh, in an unplanned way, or um, as many teachers do, just resorting to it when they are tired or short of time. So we're not talking about either, uh, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not looking at something which is at either extreme, nor which is a merely practical thing, something which, which, which has some kind of resonance to it. Okay. So that's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> I'm talking about it now, I suppose you were saying. But, but uh, let's look at the, the nature of this, this monolingual assumption, how it works as a technology, what's the relationship between the science, if, if there is any science in our discipline, uh, and the activity. Um, and I want to first of all take a historical, um, a historical angle, right? I think uh, with any technology, there's always a historical angle, isn't there? There's a way that it's emerged in society, in life, as things go on. Now I want to go back a very long way we think, you know, in language teaching, we're always kind of locked in the present. We think that everything, you know, happened very recently and so on. But very often, the things that we think are current have a very long history. So you go right back to the 19th century. And here is a man that I already mentioned, Henry Sweet, an academic. One of a group of academics, English and German academics, uh, who uh, were interested in language teaching and used their knowledge of, of language and languages to make suggestions about language teaching. They called themselves the reform movement. And they criticized grammar translation. They suggested that more emphasis was needed upon speech, upon pronunciation, upon longer texts. We would say communication, if you like. They were, as uh, Richard Smith has called them, uh, they were applied linguists, although the term did not exist, they were applied linguists avant la lettre, before the term was, before the term was coined, okay? Now, a couple of things that sort of emerged from this straight away. First of all, this is something that's happening in Europe, okay? And the history of language teaching theories is a very Eurocentric and then Anglo-centric and Anglo-American-centric history. And one always needs to think, well, how relevant is it in Thailand or or in other parts of the world. But that's the way that it is, historically. The second thing is, this is an academic, an academic who has some influence on language teaching, who uh, knows stuff, is a kind of a scientist, and has an effect, as it were, on language teaching as a technology. But then something else happens, which often happens with all technologies too. You think that Henry Sweet has a nice mustache, yeah? Well, here's a man with a bigger mustache, right? <laughs> and this is a very influential person, Maximilian Berlitz, okay? Founder of one of the biggest and most successful language teaching chains in the world, still going strong today as the Berlitz Corporation. And uh, Berlitz uh, had him also opposed grammar translation. He had a very nice story about how he came, um, he came to uh, form his views. Uh, if you believe this, I think it sounds a little bit apocryphal. 
he was teaching French in his school in the state, one of his schools in the States, and he had to go away on business. So he left the class in the hands of a man called Monsieur Jolie. Uh, so teach, the French, teach this class French while I'm away. When he came back, he found that Monsieur Jolie could not speak English, right? He only spoke French. So he'd had to teach the students French through French. And Berlitz realized that the students, or said, that the students had made great process, progress, and therefore he decided that direct method uh, would be the best way to teach. I don't know whether you believe that, but the point is that Berlitz made direct method a commercial proposition tremendously successfully. And he, he produced, talking about technology as something that contributes to industry, Berlitz uh, had a kind of production line factory approach to language teaching, interestingly, before Henry Ford, okay? We're talking about 1882, okay? Before the Ford production lines went in. The Berlitz schools were tremendously successful. One of the boasts of the Berlitz schools was that you could move country, you could go to the language class anywhere else in the world to a Berlitz school, you would enter the school, the class would be on the same page as you would have been if you stayed at home, okay? That regimented. And there was another rule in, um, in the early Berlitz schools, which was enforced by managers of schools listening in on the classrooms by microphone. And that was that anybody who uttered, any teacher who translated a single word would be fired, okay? So very industrial and very successful. So you've got here, you know, two angles of a technology, and I think this lives with us today. You know, this is the pattern of English language teaching. English language teaching is a multi-billion pound industry, okay? So yes, it's informed by academics, Henry Sweet with his nice little mustache, but it's also informed, of course, by big business. And one could say that uh, what helped direct method take off was not, direct method is another term, if you like, as I said, for the monolingual assumption. Direct method is teaching the language through the language itself. That what really made direct method take off was not so much scientific or academic, but factors concerning expediency, commerce, and politics. So uh, direct method was successful in an era of immigration, travel, and business. This is the era when the private language school began. And particularly in North America, you had m speakers of many different languages coming into a country where the English-speaking population saw the English language as, an, uh, as a unifying factor for the nation, okay? And they were learning English in mixed language classes. People were traveling more. People, the middle classes were beginning to travel. Again, I'm, you know, I'm, take, I'm speaking from a very Anglo-American, European perspective. Uh, and people were using language for business. Uh, that meant that you had multilingual classes where you can't use the student's own language, and increasingly monolingual teachers, or at least teachers who, well, th they didn't know the languages of all their students, or they didn't speak their, their students' languages very well. These are all factors uh, which are not academic, but they are in they're matters of practicality. Uh, single print runs, okay? There's a, there's a publishing technology aspect to the monolingual assumption as well. Uh, for publishers using old-fashioned printing technology, and now it's different with computerized printing, uh, it's, it's much easier to be able to make a single print run for the whole world you don't want to be, have to bother with an edition for Thailand and an, an edition for uh, you know, Kenya and an edition for Brazil. You just have one for the world, if you like. Uh, and of course, national interests. Now, I'm very into mustaches, okay, as you can see. So here's another man with a mustache, right? I don't know if anybody recognizes this gentleman. This is President Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and here's an interesting quotation from 1926 about his attitude to languages in the United States. And I just mentioned immigration in the United States and so on and so forth. He said, I can't do the accent, I apologize, okay? 
We have room but for, what, for but one language in this country, and that is the English language. For we intend to see that the crucible turns our people out as Americans of American nationality and not as dwellers in a polyglot boarding house. Okay? So there you have a very clear attitude to multilingualism, right? Very outspoken indeed. So there's a political angle, right? So lots of angles to this uh, historically apart from the academic. And I think with any technology, you, it, it, is, it is fruitful to take such a historical perspective. Next I move on to the scientific, okay? The monolingual assumption uh, is supported by applied linguistics research of certain kinds. I think myself it's possibly a political aspect of applied linguistics that we believe that the scientific research is more of a driving force than it actually is. So I see this is a, this is a very simplified scheme, but it seems to me to have a general truth. That if you look historically over the last one, uh, from the period I've just talked about, 1882, right up to the present, uh, I'll leave the very present out for the moment. You have two major changes in language teaching. So first of all, you have the cross-lingual teaching that grammar translation, if you like, what was established uh, in the secondary schools of Europe in the 19th century, and then that uh, is replaced to some extent by intralingual teaching, teaching through the language itself, the monolingual assumption of the, uh, of the kind that I've just been talking about. And then another major shift in the 1970s is from a, f a focus on form, always still focusing on grammar, even if you're teaching through the language itself, to the focus on meaning. And this shift to the focus on meaning, we associate with communicative language teaching, uh, natural, um, the natural method, as it was called, and with its successors, task-based teaching, and so on and so forth. And this change was informed by one particular strand of applied linguistic science, which is second language, acqui second language acquisition study and theory. And it was that which prompted this, switch, this, this fundamental switch from an emphasis on form to an emphasis on meaning, which many people, to my bewilderment, still seem to treat as though it was you know, the latest thing. Well, we're talking about 50 years ago now, okay? And you still, I think, find this notion that the science will move straightforwardly into action as though technology were just a matter of some people knowing the facts and then transmitting them to others. I mentioned applied linguistics earlier on. Here's a quotation from a special issue of applied linguistics, uh, which was actually about emergentism. It doesn't really matter what the, what the issue was about in 2006, so not so long ago. And one of the discussants in this issue writes, how well do these analyses succeed in generating precise predictions for patterns in language learning? Can we use these predictions to improve language learning? So there you have, I think, a very naive concept of the technology, okay? Nothing historical, nothing social, nothing evaluative. Precise predictions, that's kind of scientific, and then you take the precise predictions and you put them into the language teaching and things improve. Uh, that has a lot of problems, however, I think. Um, a lot of the assumptions, uh, well, if you talk about improving something, okay, you have to have a notion of what you mean by success. It's not to say I'm going to improve things. It's not a straightforward thing to say. You, you need to know uh, what you regard as successful so you can move closer to it. Well, a lot of SLA, a lot of meaning-based, meaning-focused language teaching has made historically a number of assumptions. One is that 
success for an English language learner means using native-like forms, uh, using them in a native-like way, uh, that the best kind of knowledge of the language will be subconscious automatic knowledge as opposed to explicit knowledge of rules. The assumption that what you're learning for is to use the language in monolingual environments. In other words, you're learning English in order to go into a place where English is the only language being spoken. And lastly, which I'll come back to later on, that with a language goes cultural behavior and implicit, very often, cultural conformity. These assumptions are, are often not stated, but they're often implicit in ideas of how you would improve language teaching. But if you look, it seems to me, at authentic language use in the contemporary world, and I say in the contemporary world, I, I guess this has always been the case, but it seems, for reasons I'll go into a bit later, to be more salient now than it was before, you would very often find that there are plenty of situations where instead of monolingual use of a language, there is continual uh, code switching, continual going backwards and forwards from one language to another. So, for example, you have even if one language dominates that relationship, there is bound to be some kind of preference for the other language in that relationship. And so there's always going to be some kind of concern for minority. You have migrant families who maintain one language at home, although they are in a different environment. You have schools. Uh, in London, we have something in the region of 300 plus languages spoken in primary schools. So we have parents who don't understand the language of the school. We have children coming in who don't uh, speak uh, English very well, who needs to be paired with another child or something of that kind. Throughout the world you have multinational, multilingual uh, workforces who may be using a lingua franca or swapping languages. You have international businesses, obviously, uh, multilingual notices, announcements, many of those in airports, uh, internet, multiple language use, and lots of, uh, you know, things like films and news where you will see a subtitle or or, or, or different language coming in. So there is a, a point to be made here, which is that can we assume or should we assume that success in learning a language means being able to operate in that language in a, mon in a monolingual environment? The point has been made you know, a long time ago. So Sridhar and Sridhar writing 1986 in a critique of SLA said, SLA researchers seem to have neglected the fact that the goal of SLA is bilingualism, okay? And I think that that rings true. If you're learning English and you're going to get a job based on your knowledge of English, you're going in some way to be used to mediate between people who don't speak such good English and English speakers who don't speak the language of the place where you're working, okay? So if you're here in Bangkok, right, you speak fantastic English, you get a job, right, based on that. Uh, that is in order to mediate between Thai speakers who don't speak much English and English speakers who don't speak any Thai, okay? A different thing, a different kind of goal. Okay, so you would think that we've got two kind of, uh, we've got here a kind of a controversy. When people learn a language, is it a good idea to use their own language for explanation, for translation, and so on and so forth, okay? And secondly, what is the goal? Is the goal to somehow become like a native speaker, or is the goal to become, as Sridhar and Sridhar say, bilingual? If it's a technology, and if SLA is the science behind it, the obvious thing would be, surely, and like any good scientist to say, Let's do some research. Now here seems to me the most extraordinary thing, okay? If you look for research on whether uh, 
the monolingual assumption is the best way to teach and learn a language in SLA throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, you won't find it, right? When I first looked into this and I thought, there isn't any, I couldn't believe it. So I, I took the lazy way out, okay? I emailed Rod Ellis. Well, Rod Ellis knows everything, <laughs> right? He's a walking encyclopedia. So rather than read through all that stuff, I thought I'll just email Rod Ellis. So I get an email back. He, he um, sorry, I've gone from one, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I've gone to the wrong slide. Um, Rod Ellis says, yes, you are right. Translation is given little attention by SLA researchers. The only exception is, and, and give some one exception, but there is no research. What I missed out is this. Here are two recent, uh, more recent articles on uh, use of translation. Unfortunately, empirical work on the effect of translation exercises on L2 learners' morphosyntax is scant. Or another one on vocabulary. To our knowledge, no research has examined the, vol val the value of contrastive fo form-focused instruction on vocabulary, such as interlingual comparisons with learners' first language or translation. So no research, quite extraordinary, actually. So I've looked at the, the, the issue of the monolingual assumption from a historical point of view and from a scientific point of view. What about from a pedagogic point of view? What do I mean by pedagogy? Pedagogy, I mean, um, you know, does it work with the students, right? Well, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad science or where it came from historically. Is it something that's going to work? Something that the independent learning people are probably very interested in. Here's an unusual source of uh, comment on pedagogy. This grinning man is Noam Chomsky. Uh, he says, uh, psychology and linguistics have caused a good deal of harm by pretending to have answers to those questions and telling teachers how they should behave. Often the ideas presented by the scientists are totally crazy and they may cause trouble. The truth of the matter is that about 90% of teaching is making making the students interested in the material. And again, I've played the same trick, okay? I thought, is there any research on whether using the first language is motivational or not? <laughs> this is a lazy way out, you see. Email Zoltan Dernier is supposed to be the leading figure on motivation in language learning. Same answer. I haven't heard of any data-based L2 motivation studies that use L1 use in the classroom as a motivational variable. Very strange. But there has in recent years been quite a movement to suggest that there might be many pedagogic reasons why using students' own languages could be beneficial. And I'll just run through some of these uh, fairly quickly. I've, you've got a handout with references you may wish to follow them up for yourself, okay? So first of all, as Henry Widdison points out, there's nothing you can do about it, okay? It is the natural thing to do. If you ban people from translating, seeking explanations in their own language, they will do it anyway. They will whisper to a neighbor, they will formulate it in their own mind, they will look in a bilingual dictionary or whatever. Ironic, actually, that the notions of you know, always seeking out what is natural and what is real, which was the, you know, one of the kind of uh, slogans of the communicative approach and its descendants, should actually try to ban what is the most natural thing of all, that when you learn something, you try to collect, connect uh, the new knowledge to the old knowledge. And with learning a language, that means trying to relate the new language to your own language. Secondly, maybe it reduces stress. Suresh Kanagaraja, uh, writing about teaching of English in Sri Lanka, uh, makes the point that by using Tamil, it helps, the, you know, it, it establishes rapport, it helps students relax, and so on and so forth. Uh, Edstrom, this is actually one of the most impressive pieces of research I've ever read, because uh, she started out with a very hard-line view that you should never use the student's own language. But having uh, studied the effects when she is teaching Spanish to English speakers uh, comes to completely the opposite point of view, that it's very hard to have a relationship, a very important teacher-student relationship, 
if you always have to speak in a language which the students don't speak very well. That's not the best language to form that particular relationship in. And Brooks Lewis, writing in Applied Linguistics a few years ago, uh, I won't read this all the way through, but her argument really was that um, it is extremely disconcerting and infantilizing when you start uh, a language class to be suddenly forced into a situation where you're not allowed to speak your own language. You don't know what's going on. It isn't the language you speak in your classroom. It's not the language you speak in your Okay, so I've, I've whizzed through uh, three perspectives, which I think would apply to any technology. Uh, it, it's history. The nature of the science that informs it. And I think with a monolingual assumption, there isn't any, okay? Uh, and thirdly, the pedagogy. How the audience responds. Whether it works, whether it works for the audience. And the last criterion is educational, and this takes me back in a way to what I was saying uh, historically. Educational criteria are about values. So we teach things not only for, you know, uh, reasons of um, practicality. Teaching expresses values. And teaching may lead to personal fulfillment and development. It may lead to social change. Or it may lead to knowledge and activities which are socially useful. So maybe we need to think when we think about a particular uh, teaching strategy, such as the monolingual assumption, what kind of values it promotes in the contemporary world. Not what kind of values it promotes in 1882, but what kind of values it's promoting in uh, 2014. We live in a, I mean, this, this is kind of platitudes, if you like but important platitudes nevertheless. We live in a very different world from the world in which, say, communicative language teaching came to be the dominant mode of language teaching 40, 50 years ago, let alone the world in which direct method was born 150 years ago. So we live in a world of globalization, of increasingly complex I linguistic and national identities, increasingly mobile migrant populations, and a result of that, increasing multiple language use, and of course a world of digital communication as well, and something I don't have time to go into here in great detail, but I'm sure you're all familiar with, the notion of English as a lingua franca. The fact that if we're talking about the learning of English, as opposed to the learning of other languages, the majority of interactions in English in the world are likely to be uh, between people for whom, for neither of whom English is a native language. Makes it a very different activity indeed. So it's in this context that we need to think about the monolingual assumption and the kind of values that it expresses. I quoted President Teddy Roosevelt uh, before from 1926, but of course, uh, those kind of values are still very much with us today. So here we have a photograph from contemporary America. This is America, says the sign on the window, when ordering speak English. English only, please. English only zone. No, this is not the cover of an English language textbook. This is a sign outside a small town in Midwest America where the mayor had decided that everybody in this town should speak English. And I'm afraid to say that in Britain we have similar things going on at the moment. This is the, uh, this very handsome, charming, friendly looking man is the leader of the UK Independence Party, which is doing very well at the moment. And you can't read the small print at the bottom, but he's saying that um, uh, he was horrified uh, to go on a train out of London and he couldn't hear, hear anybody speaking English and he thought this was absolutely disgraceful. And this is linked very much to a very, I find, very unpleasant uh, atmosphere of xenophobia and nationalism among supporters of that party in Britain 
where uh, uh, we are told, told about floods of immigrants who uh, should go home. So there is a kind of political connection to a monolingual attitude, and it may have even more ancient roots. This is the Tower of Babel from the Jewish and Christian scriptures, uh, whose story you may know, um, so that uh, at one time, so the story goes, the whole earth uh, was of one language and of one speech. People tried to build a tower to heaven. God was angry with them. So, uh, I can't read this. Well, he did confound their language that they may not understand one another. So, um, it's almost as though, uh, you know, speaking one language is a good thing. Speaking lots of languages is a bad thing. And it wouldn't be that difficult to change uh, that kind of rather fascistic national slogan, one nation, one people, one language, which you can find expressed in all sorts of nationalist movements all around the world to the, you know, the notion of one classroom, one learner, one language. So there is a kind of a political situation here, okay? We express political values through the way that we teach and learn languages, and I think there's a choice to be made as to whether we want to be on the side of, you know, it's good if everybody speaks the same language, or we're encouraging and promoting a more monolingual attitude. Uh, let's go. just go back. I'll, I'll be coming to an end shortly. We'll be, the, fl the plane will be touching down. Think about communicative language teaching, go back. And again, I'm not criticizing the people, you, you know, for, for what they wrote at the time. Uh, times are different, okay? But this is from a book by Keith Morrow and Keith Johnson called Communicate, okay? Very much, you know, of the time of uh, monolingual teaching, focus on cultural identity and so on and so forth. There was an exercise in this book. Um, about how to behave if you learn English and you come to England. You're visiting the house of a British friend. It's very beautiful. Do you, A, tell him how beautiful it is, B, ask how much it costs, or C, ask if he'll take you around every room? Go to the back of the book. There's a right answer, right? The right answer is uh, A, okay? Uh, you meet a British friend in the street. You last saw him two days ago. Do you just say hello? Say hello and shake his hand, put your arm around his shoulder and slap him on the back. The right answer is A. <laughs> or the best one of all, you're at a party and have just been introduced to someone. While you are talking, he mentions that his wife is not at the party. It seems that only men, only men learn languages. Do you ask where his wife is? Change the subject, ask if he gets on well with his wife. Okay. Uh, very funny. <laughs> like, it's interesting, it's a bit like the, um, a bit like the um, uh, making you laugh at the uh, grammar translation. I think you're right to laugh. We should now laugh at those old-fashioned kind of communicative language teaching assumptions that we always teach uh, the culture with the language. Um, so just to sum up what I've uh, said, okay? The monolingual assumption, right? if we evaluate it, and this is the point, I think, that all technologies need evaluation. The monolingual assumption dissociates new from existing knowledge, develops only monolingual skills, hinders confidence and explicit knowledge, denies the inevitable, hinders teacher-student rapport, and fails to redress language imbalances, right? It also has promoted native speaker rather than bilingual international models of English, it's demoted non-native speaker teachers to second-class status, and it has seen language learning as unrelated to language, to learners' own language and identity. Own language use, on the other hand, has no science, sound scientific evidence against it, makes pedagogic sense, is relevant and useful, maintains diversity and identity. And it also factors aspects of expertise that are suited to the world of 2014 rather than the world of 1970 or 1882. Uh, the ability to move, mediate, and translate between languages, metalinguistic knowledge, international comprehensibility, individual and cultural identity. Literacy and com computer multimodal literacy and computer and modal, multimodal literacy as well. 
So what I'm... And there is, sorry, and there is quite a... a so, transactional, social, and creative functions as well. And there is, I think, now, so going back to my diagram, which takes us only up to the mid-1970s, there is now quite a strong movement for a return to own language use in language learning, which I believe has arguments on its side, both historical, scientific, pedagogic, and educational. I hope, I've worked through, as it were, one example of a technology, but I hope that uh, there are some principles here for assessing any applied linguistic technology. That yes, it needs to be informed by science, but there are also essential aspects that are historical and evaluative. So, as we come into land, okay, now you can fasten your seat belts and put your seats upright and wake up. Uh, we see that what I just said. Yes, applied linguistics is a technology and one which is broadening in scope. In practice, it is driven by history and expediency. It is only informed by research, but ultimately it is and it should be driven by values. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Cook. We now have 15 minutes for your burning questions. The microphone right. is available, so please just raise your hand and the gentleman behind you will you know, walk to you. Any questions? I can't hear you. He's going to ask okay. uh, the question in Thai. In the Thai society. The family seems to have a say in um, choosing the teacher, uh, a native uh, teacher, to teach their kids. So the university, universities and schools would uh, prefer to hire native-speaking teachers. So Thai teachers may be considered um, second class. Um, what's your idea about that? Uh, what's, sorry, so the question is what do I think about Thai institutions preferring native speaker English teachers. Um, I, I think one has to be very careful. Uh, I, I'm talking about extremes at the beginning. One would not want to go from one extreme to the other extreme, okay? So there are many native speaking English teachers who do a, a fantastically good job and can, uh, um, uh, can teach in a way which is, you know, in which their native speakerness makes uh, an important contribution. However, right, uh, for a long period of time, non-native speaker teachers were treated as second-class teachers, okay? And that is completely wrong. And there are many ways in which uh, I think um, the best, uh, the, the teacher who is a speaker of your own language can be the better teacher because they understand the particular problems and they can also uh, explain complicated things in your own language uh, and also do translation, which I think is a very important activity. Um, so, 
Uh, I wouldn't want, I, I, I don't think it would be a good idea to go from saying native speaker teachers are best to saying uh, native speaker teachers are worst, but there's certainly no uh, reason, I think, to say that um, a non-native speaker teacher is any worse, I, 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 is bad. I mean, I, think, I don't think that's the issue, actually. Um, the other factor which has to be taken into account is the one I mentioned about English as a lingua franca. Um, if, it depends. Most people are no longer learning English to go into a native speaking English environment. They're, u they're learning English for uh, international communication. Native English speakers are not necessarily the best communicators in English in an international environment. Many native English speakers are incomprehensible outside of their own locality. <laughs> many native English speakers do not know English as well as many non-native speakers. Do we need to translate that back into Thai for you? <laughs> okay, the next question. Hi, um, I'm Helen from Asia Pacific, but I used to teach in Taiwan. I'm talking about Chinese. Yeah. When I think uh, the world today is aware of Chinese, uh, which is dominating the world uh, when it comes to business yeah. and our economy. Uh, most of the Chinese students, uh, they depend so much on this grammar translation method. And uh, in your opinion, because to my understanding, students from China, Taiwan, uh, who want to learn English, the, it's, it's just so difficult for them to learn the native language of English, but they prefer the grammar translation. But how we can be able to help them, because for them, the purpose of learning English is just for business. They're not actually going to America to work. Yeah, of course but uh, they do it uh, for the sake of making money, business. Now, in this situation, what is the best way? I don't know. Probably there are many ways to help them of the teaching method that we should be using. But again, um, grammar translation is still the main, very famous all over, although there are many critics about it. But how can we be able to help them? Because many and many of them really, not only in Thailand, but everywhere in the world, how can we be able to help them? And at the same time, in our, you know, with our economy, how we could work together and in the classroom, how we can help our students. So what kind of um, teaching methodologies that would you highly suggest to help this kind of... Well, you, there seems to be a lot of questions. <laughs> They're very <laughs> interesting questions, but they're actually quite a lot of questions altogether. Well, first of all, I think um, uh, grammar translation has many merits, actually, and if you've, if you've studied... Uh, it's not enough in itself, but if you've studied gra grammar translation, it is, uh, you know, you acquire a knowledge which is very useful, and you have a certain confidence about what you know and what you don't know, which I think is very important. Um, but as far as uh, Chinese people, as you say, wanting to make money uh, by knowing a language, I think um, I agree with Chomsky. I don't think the method is all that important. If people are motivated, uh, they will learn despite or because of the method. I think maybe we're too hung up on, on different methods, actually. Um, but I don't know if that answers your question or not. Well, I, th I think, well, in a way, you did. You, the, I, I, I mean, I think one of the things that people are not taking into account now, okay, is that um, there is so, if you're talking about t learning and teaching English, right, there is so much uh, access to English online that uh, what happens in a classroom can be seen as simply a supplement, okay? So, so the issue of, of access to authentic communicative English is now very different. Uh, and authentic communicative English doesn't anymore uh, involve necessarily being face to face in a physical location. You don't have to be on the street in New York or Sydney or, or London uh, to use English. So 
surely we ought to move to a situation where we see that what happens in the classroom is supplementary, right, to uh, real communicative activity that the students are engaging with on the internet. I just was doing, I'm, I'm involved in a research project where we're looking at young adults' needs in three European, well, three, two European and one non-European European country, Romania, Germany, and Turkey, and I just did some research in Romania with 18, 20-year-olds, okay? They are, for example, the boys are doing well. Now, usually it's the girls who do well. Why are the boys doing well? Because they're members of uh, online groups playing computer games. So some Romanian boy is in a group with a Spanish boy and an American boy and a Mexican boy and a Japanese boy, and they're all playing the same game online in English, okay? And they're, they're, you know, they're streets ahead of their teachers in many ways. So you've got to take that into account. I think the notion, you know, you ask a question about what is the best methodology in the classroom, but the classroom is broken open now. Kids, uh, students are no longer just in a classroom. They're also in an international classroom as soon as they sit down at a computer. I don't know if, you, if people agree with me about that, but it seems to me that the notion that everything happens in the classroom is gone. The classroom is like a remedial uh, thing. And moreover, uh, computer activity is no longer a way of learning the language. It's also the goal of learning a language. So uh, a major part of real communication is online in one way or another. Okay, um, one more question, probably. We're running out of time. But Professor Cook will be with us for the next three days. So if you have any more questions, you can talk to uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Jamie Hall uh, from Japan. All right, hi. And hi. And um, a lot of my uh, colleagues uh, how can uh, SLA methods be applied to the Japanese context? And these are, my, of course, my Japanese friends. Um, now, I've been involved in research and learning. The more I research and learning, the more I forget about And you're riding on your, flying on your plane. It seemed that you were a little bit dubious about how SLA can be linked to uh, language teaching. Mm. Uh, could you talk a, a little bit about that? Or what do, you, what do you think is the role of SLA well, in I, language teaching? Yeah, thank you. That's a very, I'm glad you asked that question. Okay, <laughs> maybe I just, I, I, I have um, very grave reservations about SLA in all sorts of ways. And one of them, maybe I didn't make it explicit enough in my talk, it, but it, I think it's clear from things like the McQuinney quotation that I used is the assumption that, that it's the academic knowledge that is the major driving force. I think the things that drove the influence of SLA were more political and commercial, actually, than, than scientific. There are so many things that SLA has overlooked. Um, one of them I mentioned uh, was failing to research uh, the use of translation or other languages. But another one in, in uh, mainstream SLA has been uh, the negligence of variations between languages. Now, you say you're from Japan, okay? Well, learning English uh, for a Japanese speaker is very, very different from learning English for an Italian speaker. Uh, you start with a completely different writing system, for, uh, right. a, com a, a typologically very different language and a very different culture, okay? And one of the things that... Um, that SLA didn't address for various reasons of dogma, I think, was that you have to take into account the pair of languages, right? It, 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 learning, you know, learning Chinese if you're Thai is very different from learning Portuguese if you're um, Danish. You know, I mean, it just doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to talk about language teaching and learning as a general thing both from a linguistics point of view, because languages are typologically very different, writing systems are very different, uh, and from a political and cultural point of view. So, uh, well, to be frank, I, I think that the, the notion that SLA research is 
or should be the main driving force in how we teach and learn is very misguided indeed. I'm probably offended. I, I, I'm, I'm sure there are various people going to going to slip my throat when I'm walking around there. <laughs> well, not walking, when I'm wheeling around. <laughs> Stab me in the back. Report me to the authorities. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, may we have um, Associate Professor Dr. Panapita Suwang back on the stage to present our speaker a token of appreciation. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll look at it later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, refreshments and snacks are now waiting outside, but we need to torture you with a few announcements. Um, we've got a few announcements to make, and by a few, I mean 14. <laughs> first thing first, registration and pickup uh, and receipts. If you haven't registered or paid, sorry, please do so at the registration desk right outside. And if the receipt is very important to you, please hold on to them. Any typos or mistakes, please also contact the staff. And if you haven't received the name tag or the receipt, please also contact the registra uh, registration desk right outside. In the back, um, you will find a blue program book with the details of all the speakers and their abstracts. But please ignore the timetable in there. The three separate A4 sheets are the latest version. And then you've got the um, proceedings in orange. Due to a technical mistake, all the accepted articles are included in the proceedings, and there will be no CD. A copy of Reflections, our double-blind peer review academic journal, published twice a year, is also provided. If you're interested in having your work published with us, please also consult the guidelines for author's page. Along with the three things, you are also given a notebook and a pen, and they are from our lovely sponsors, DK Today and Macmillan. Now, this is a very special news. Um, the conference bag you are carrying comes from the orphanage, Ban Kunoi. In joining us today, you have already supported those children. We do have more bags available for purchase right outside, where you can also make donations. Um, the money will go straight to the orphanage. And last year, last time, I'm sorry, last time we sold 52 bags and money donations were 8,065 baht. And the donations came in Thai baht, US dollars, and Australian dollars. So congratulations. Um, rooms for sessions will be on the first, the fifth, and the ninth floors. Two lifts are right outside, but don't forget, if you take the stairs, you'll be healthier. <laughs> Speak speaker's lounge and conference office are located on the seventh floor, and on the right from the lifts, you will find the pra a prayer room for our Muslim fellows, room 706 to be exact. Um, it is um, this may be something you like to know, Wi-Fi and Internet. We have 30 Wi-Fi accounts for you to sign up. Um, do not just look so disappointed. Um, we do have live outside Facebook, right? Um, if you need the Internet, please call, contact the information desk right outside. But we also have the speaker slot where you can, have, uh, you can use the Internet as well. The morning of Friday, we have the poster fair. So please come round to view the posters in room 103 here, 103. They will be on display from the morning of Friday through to Saturday. Please also support the new and young researchers by attending the Novice Forum, scheduled to be the last lot of sessions today. Shopping can wait. Keep yourselves updated on the changes, and you can also post things on, these, on those boards as well. We have the boards on all floors, floors one, five, and nine. Bricks. Please hold on to your badges as well. We also recycle them at the end of the conference. And don't forget the, um, that the times for Tong Tara Hotel will be at 7.30 tomorrow and 8 o'clock on Saturday. 
we will drop you off from here, from KMUGT to Tong Tara at 4.45. And if you are new to Thailand, tourist information can be obtained also at the information desk right outside. And if you do have time to spare, please also visit our humble self-access learning center on the fourth floor and our modest resources center on the fifth floor. Enjoy conferencing. Thank you very much.